Ancient myths of celestial cataclysms often recount tales of apocalyptic events and the fortuitous deliverance of a select few. Among these narratives, flood stories stand as the most ubiquitous, transcending cultures worldwide. While assessing these myths for their scientific veracity is beside the point, it is noteworthy that other catastrophic events, such as the annihilation of Lot's tribe, also led to the extinction of humanity. These enduring narratives provide a glimpse into our collective fascination with cosmic upheavals and the indomitable human spirit amidst devastation. It is a common belief that Noah's flood occurred because of the curse of Noah in 4100 BC when he was around 600 years old. The Torah mentions that Noah was born 1056 years after the creation of Adam and 126 years after his death. We can find the most reliable information about the flood in Sumerian sources because Sumerians were the first state established after the Flood. The first written documents date from the Sumerians, and the story of the Babylonian Flood is also of Sumerian origin. The Sumerian version of the Flood has survived as a fragmentary text with many gaps. In Sumer and Akkad, the Flood is remembered as one of the greatest disasters in human history. According to the Sumerian version, the gods decide to cause a Flood and destroy humanity. But some of the gods do not like it. One of the gods informs King Ziasudra, who is pious, God-fearing, and receives divine revelations, that a flood will break out and asks him to build a ship. The flood covers the country for seven days and seven nights. Ziasudra survives the deluge by building a ship. When he comes out of the ship, he offers a sacrifice, and the gods immortalize him and place him in Dilmun, where the sun rises. This tablet written in Sumerian, a second fragment written in Old Babylonian, consisting of a few lines describing the Flood, was found. The story of the Flood of the Babylonians is found in the Epic of Gilgamesh. The extant text of the Epic comes from the Ashurbanipal Library and is a copy of very old original texts. The Epic was written on 12 tablets. The Flood is on the 11th tablet. In the Gilgamesh Epic, the goddess Ishtar, or Inanna, is shown among the causes of the Flood and the way it occurred. It is goddess Ishtar and Bel who started the Flood. Rumor has it that a colossal deluge engulfed the entire world in the Great Flood. However, a more plausible and consistent theory suggests that only a specific region, such as Mesopotamia, experienced the watery catastrophe, based on compelling findings. Ancient civilizations had a limited understanding of the world beyond their own territories. For instance, King Sargon's map depicted Mesopotamia as the entirety of the world. So, it's reasonable to assume that the flood in Mesopotamia was misconstrued as a global event. Archaeological evidence supports significant flood disasters in cities like Kish and Ur. Moreover, the astonishment that greeted the discovery of America reminds us that ancient people likely considered their immediate surroundings as their world. Hence, it is unsurprising that they held such limited perceptions. According to the Mesopotamians, the universe consisted only of the places where they lived. Just they thought that the whole universe consisted of the earth. They may very well have thought that the world consisted of the region where they lived. According to ancient scriptural accounts, as written in the Torah, a time came when the wickedness of humanity reached such heights that the divine decision was made to eradicate mankind entirely. So the flood unfolded as a cataclysmic deluge that engulfed the entire planet, obliterating all living beings save for Noah and his kin. In the somber narrative, Yahweh proclaims, I will wipe off the face of the earth the people, the beasts, the creeping things, and the birds of the sky that I have created, for I regret that I have created them. This divine decree signifies the profound remorse felt by the Creator at the necessity of such a devastating purge. Considering the prevalent belief that only Noah, alongside those who placed their faith in him, found salvation while all others perished, and with Noah regarded as the second progenitor of humanity, it is conceivable that the genesis of the flood narratives, found in various forms throughout the world, stems from a single origin radiating outwards to encompass the entirety of human civilization. However, it is worth noting that many flood narratives across diverse cultures diverge from the accounts found in the Bible and the Quran. These alternate tales often depict the flood as localized rather than global, 
with protagonists rescuing themselves through vessels or by ascending mountains without the intervention of gods. Additionally, the duration of these floods varies, spanning from mere days to several years. In the Quranic tradition, Noah emerges as a prophet sent to guide his own people, and the ensuing flood serves as a divine retribution upon those who rejected his message. Yet, an ethical quandary arises when contemplating the notion of unleashing a catastrophe upon the entire world for the transgressions of a specific tribe. Devastating regions unrelated to Noah's people and indiscriminately extinguishing all forms of life due to the actions of a few dissenters. Such profound narratives of ancient floods invite contemplation and spark introspection regarding the complex interplay between divine justice, human beliefs, and the eternal search for meaning in the face of catastrophic events. Noah warned his people not to worship anyone other than Allah and inform them of the punishment that would otherwise befall them. And when he saw that his people did not give up idolatry after long struggles, he prayed to Allah to punish the unbelievers. And Allah accepted his prayer and asked him to build an ark, informing him that his disbelieving people would be destroyed by a flood and that he and the believers would be saved. The Quran only mentions that the ark was made of wood and nailed with nails, but does not give any information about its other qualities. It is narrated that when the command came, build the ark before our eyes and according to our revelation, Noah asked Noah where he could get wood. He was ordered to plant trees, and he planted trees called Indian oaks. After 40 years, he cut these trees and built the ark. Jabriel teaches him how to build the ark. The head of the ship resembles the head of a rooster, the body resembles the body of a bird, and the back part resembles the tail of a rooster. Noah was commanded to take on board a pair from each of the living creatures, his family, and the believers, except those for whom judgment has been pronounced. There is various information about this ark and its size. The opinion of Islamic scholars is that it was big enough to hold 80 believers in Noah and their necessities and a pair of animals that existed there. The event of the flood has taken place in many cultures, except for the African continent and some parts of Asia, as well as in celestial religions such as Judaism, Christianity and Islam, although the content is different. For example, in Australian flood narratives, a giant frog that swallows all the water is mentioned. Animals distraught with thirst, decide to make this frog laugh. The water coming out of the mouth of the laughing frog causes a flood. In India, the flood event is mentioned for the first time in the Katapatha Brahmana. A fish informs Manu, the ancestor of the human race, of the imminent flood and advises him to build a ship. When the flood began, the fish towed the ship northwards and stopped it near a mountain. In the Iranian belief, the world ends because of a cataclysm caused by the melting of snow accumulated during a terrible winter. According to Greek mythology, the god Zeus decides to destroy people who sin more and more with a flood. Prometheus informs his son Deucalion of Zeus's decision and advises him to build a boat. Deucalion builds the boat and gets on this boat with his wife, and after nine days and nine nights of drifting in the waters, he sets foot on the Parnassus mountain at the end of the flood. According to Islamic beliefs, Noah's Ark sat on Mount Judy after the flood. It is said in the Quran that the Ark sat on Mount Judy. This event is mentioned in Surah Hud. O earth, swallow your water. O sky, it was said to hold your water. The water was withdrawn and the work was finished. And the ship sat on Judy, and it was said, May the people of the wrongdoers be far from the mercy of Allah. Today, the mountain falls within the borders of Sirnak province of the Republic of Turkey. The name Sirnak is a very old name meaning city of Noah. At the foot of Mount Judy is the village of Heshtan, whose name means 80. The village of Heshtan is believed to have been founded by Noah and is named after the 80 people believed by the Talmud and Hadith to have been on Noah's Ark. In the Torah, this mountain is described as follows. In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark sat on Mount Ararat. The Ararat Mountains mentioned here does not refer to a specific location for the ship, but rather to a range of mountains within the territory of the Urartu Empire, which ruled in 900, 600 BC centered on Lake Van. The most important problem about Mount Judy is that the place where Noah's Ark ran aground has not been open to sufficient research and archaeological excavations. Perhaps, with the unearthing of the remains of Noah's Ark on Mount Judy, an end will be put to the debates about where the Ark was moored. If you like the video, please like 
and do not forget to subscribe to my channel.